like to introduce Father John tonight, who will be giving the first of our Lenten series of talks on knowing Jesus better in 2023. And, you know, Father has said that he's going to speak on some very practical ideas that he's had uh, with regard to preparing and living and walking through Lent. And I think, you know, on this 25th anniversary of his ordination, he's had a lot of pastoral experience with leading people and guiding people on this walk. So um, we will have this presentation, and at the end, there'll be time for questions. Okay, Father John? Thank you, Tony, and thank you to those who are here tonight. Also, uh, greetings to those who are watching this uh, as is reported and posted later. Now, some thoughts about as we begin Lent. Now, yesterday, the church celebrated a famous bishop who died halfway through the second century of the Christian era. Since Fathers is my background, uh, I thought I'd start with that, and that would be St. Polycarp. Now, I'm using some thoughts from a wonderful book by Robert Ellsberg called Blessed Among Us, Day by Day, by Day Witness with Saintly Witnesses. Now, Apollo Carp was one of the most revered of the Apostolic Fathers. That would be that generation of bishops who received their faith from the original apostles. According to tradition, Apollo Carp had been a disciple of St. John the Evangelist. As a young man, he met St. Ignatius of Antioch and kissed his chains as, and, um, as he passed, Ignatius passed through Smyrna on his way to martyrdom in Rome. And lately, later, years later, as an old man, Polycarp met his own death as a martyr. The account of his death, which was circulated in a letter from Smyrna, uh, is the oldest account of Christian martyrdom outside of the New Testament. So basically, it's Stephen and the others who died as martyrs, in the Acts of the Apostles, and, and James as well, and now Polycarp. And as this text affirmed, martyrs are not simply those who suffered for their beliefs. Polycarp's martyrdom was one that was conformable to the gospel. In other words, his death, the death of the holy bishop, was a mystical reenactment of the passion of Christ. At the time of his arrest in the year 155, Polycarp was 86, a spring chicken, okay? Having served as the bishop for many decades, when ordered to worship Caesar, he replied, how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Now, he was sentenced to be burned, but the narrator, the person writing the letter, records a marvelous sign. For the fire made the shape of a, a vaulted chamber like a, a ship's sail, filled by the wind and made a wall around the body of the martyr. And he was in its midst, not as burning flesh, but as bed, uh, bread baking, or as gold and silver refined in a furnace. You can hear the scripture references. So the whole crowd marveled at this. Now, Father Leonard Foley and Father Pat McCloskey uh, make this comment about Polycarp in their book, Saint of the Day. Polycarp was recognized as a Christian leader by all Asia Minor Christians. Strong fortress of faith, loyalty to Jesus Christ, his own strength emerges from his trust in God, even when events contradicted that trust. In other words, he held firm. Living among pagans and under a government opposed to the new religion, he led and fed his flock. Like the good shepherd, he laid down his life for his sheep and kept them from more persecution in Smyrna. He summarized his trust in God just before he died. Father, I bless thee for having made me worthy of the day and the hour. That's from his martyrdom, chapter 14. Well, Polycarp died in the second century. Well, a lot of time has lapsed since then. But was I maybe thinking, what's the relevance? The point of the relevance would be that martyrdom continues even into our own time. And just last week, February the 17th to be exact, uh, in Oklahoma City, Archbishop Stephen, uh, rather Paul Coakley, presided over the dedication of the shrine in honor of Blessed Stanley Rother. 
while while well, well in mission work in Santiago, Atilan, in Guatemala, 1981, was shot to death by three marked masked rather assassins who entered his rectory during the, and this is during the nation's civil war that lasted for 36 years, and uh, during which approximately 200,000 people were killed or simply disappeared. Stanley Rother entered the seminary after high school. He grew up on a farm, uh, and he was a hard, hard worker. Now, in his decision to enter the seminary surprised his family because quickly his sister, who had already entered the convent, because he had not studied Latin in high school. And so, uh, and in the seminary, as he did at that time, Latin was a very important subject to have because he was Latin with, he was difficult with Latin, he had difficulty with his studies. And after several years, the seminary rector uh, recommended he be dismissed because he didn't have the, uh, the, you know, the, the, because his Latin wasn't good enough that he couldn't follow theological studies. Well, Stanley pleaded with the local bishop. This would be Bishop Victor Reed uh, of, of the Diocese of Tulsa. Please give me another chance. And so Father Reed turned to a priest who had been teaching Latin uh, locally. His name was Father Joseph Dillon, and he is related to me. He actually is a first cousin of my father's. Uh, and I found this out when I found out that Joe had left active ministry many years ago, had gone to the beatification of Stanley Rother. And I realized they there from Oklahoma. I said, did you know him? He said, know him? I taught him. And I'm the one who made the recommendation to Bishop Reed this man deserves another chance. We should find another seminary for him. The bishop took up that recommendation, sent him to Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Amherstburg, where he finished, and to this day is the only uh, blessed to have graduated from that seminary with all the priests who've come through in the uh, 200 years of that seminary's existence. But uh, anyway, so he was ordained, and then he, he served in several parishes and the diocese before volunteering to for the mission work with Santiago Atilan in Guatemala in 1968. Now he spent 13 years in Guatemala and about six months before he was killed on July the 28th, 1981, he wrote in a Christmas letter that the shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger and he chose to remain in Guatemala knowing that it might cost him his life. At the dedication of the shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother, Archbishop Coakley spoke about the example that Rother set for all Catholics. And this is where we're getting in more practical kind of things. Laity, at a time when much of the country and the world is becoming even more, ever more hostile to the faith. He said that the times call for a certain measure of heroism and intentionality. Heroism that comes only from living out of a deep, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The world into which we are sent to go make disciples needs committed priests. It needs holy marriages and families, the Archbishop said. It needs dedicated lay leaders and the professions to renew the culture in the light of the gospel, the fragrance of Christ, and the attractive beauty of holiness. We need faithful witnesses and fervent missionary disciples. The Archbishop continued, let us learn. Let us study the example of our blessed brother, Stanley Rother, and confidently seek his intercession. We will be found faithful as he was faithful, all will be welcomed as he was welcomed into the company of the saints. If someone from uh, Oak Archie, Oklahoma, can be beatified, become a saint, then by good golly, anybody can. Coakley said, because that's the beauty of Rother. He was one of us, a very ordinary man, a hardworking man, a man of strong convictions, uh, a man of deep faith, but not born with a halo. Just Stanley Rother, pray for us. So I put, his, I put the example of these two, uh, Bishop St. Polycarp, uh, who was a bishop, and Stanley Rother who was not a bishop, but a priest, both of them who died as martyrs, looking at their virtues, asking them to strengthen us in the times in which we live. Now, 
want to, I want to shift a bit in this last part of the talk. I want to look at uh, a scripture that the church puts before us. We first saw it, there was a prayer liturgy of the hours on, on Ash Wednesday for the Office of Readings, Isaiah chapter 58. The very important chapter uh, for us uh, as we begin Lent, and the church gives it to us every year. And, you know, the way, when we look at what the, how things are structured, we learn some important things. And Isaiah 58 gives us some very important things to look at as we begin our observance of Lent. And the readings in Lent, Lent are one of the most ancient in the liturgy. And so this has been set before us for many, many centuries because the church, is, her wisdom sees so these are things we need to look at. Now, today we had, on Mass, we had uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 to 9. Tomorrow, for those who go to Mass or those who are following the readings, We'll have Isaiah 58, verses 9b in the second half of nine, chapter, verse 9 to verse 14. In the first selection, Isaiah complains that God does not heed their fasting. Uh, God rebukes them for abusing their poor on their fast days, doing just because he said doing justice is true fast. In the second selection, we hear that those who are blessed, who care for the poor, the oppressed, and the hungry, and observe the Sabbath day. Now, these early readings in Lent serve to instruct us in what constitutes fasting that is truly pleasing to the Lord. We're called to turn away from sins. Ideally, fasting should be an external representation of what is going on in our hearts. What should happen in our hearts is that we're transformed to be as compassionate and loving as God is. True fasting involves service to the poor, widows and orphans, reaching out to those who are broken or sheltering the oppressed and homeless. Our faith can't just be an internal reality. We believe and therefore God will save us. That's more theory than a faith. We need to express our faith in our external actions. And from the earliest days, fasting and almsgiving were, have been connected so that the money that we save from not spending it on food, we take that money and we give it to the poor. That's the reason I think that the, the genius of something like Operation Rice Bowl really is good because it, it makes that connection. There's a use of rice bowls that the money we save, it, it really, really goes toward poor. You know, and so I'm just looking at the concept of fasting for a minute. How did the church, early church practice it? And I'm, I'm just putting this out here because when we look at we do what we do, uh, it's really nothing in, in some ways in comparison. The early Christian fast was very similar to Ramadan. Uh, with, the, with the Muslims observed today. You know, that nothing from sun up to sundown. That's what fasting meant. Now, in monastic life in the West, um, the rule had been that uh, nothing to eat until after Vespers. So, um, many of the monks who were working on farms and whatnot found that very hard. So what did they do? They move the time of Vespers up. Uh, so instead of being an evening of prayer, you know, it was that right at evening time, it was moved to noon. Uh, and then, you now this just shows you how things really develop with us, with our fasting rules today. So nothing, you know, so nothing after Vespers, when the Vespers is now at noon, that becomes the main meal of the day. But later in the day, the people got home, so they said, well, you can have a small snack. That's the collation. Then finally, for those who weren't going to receive communion, you, you could break the fast and then have what we call breakfast. So that's so that when we look at the rules for fasting today, the quantity and the days in which we're supposed to fast, the quantity and quality of the other two meals should not represent the quantity and quality that we have in the main meal. Now, uh, Pope St. Paul VI wrote an instruction in the 1960s called Let Us Do Penance, which is really worth looking at because it goes through has some wonderful points for us to look at about really what doing penance should mean in our days. And he says practical things we can find, you know, in the, in the times gone by, we people would do penance with extraordinary things. They take the discipline. You know, there's a story in one of Flannery O'Connor's uh, short stories about one of the characters scourging himself. The other character seeing him doing this says, what are you doing? Nobody does that kind of thing anymore which the character said, well, if I'm doing it, somebody's doing it, you know. 
and it would, uh, that would be the, 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 that was a practice that went on in I know I know with the with the Capuchins until uh, you know until, until, you know, until recent times to be on Fridays particularly Fridays in Lent they'd be they'd take the discipline and that would be the scourging themselves. Well, in Paul the Sixth says there's plenty of penance just in daily life. The inconveniences and the aggravations we have, even living with each other, can be um, it can be an opportunity just you know just instead of giving in to anger or frustration, saying, "All right, Lord, I have to deal with this." You know, my, like my schedule changes, you know, these are the kind of things. Penance really shows itself for me in this way very often, just, you know, like things unexpected. And then I have to change course to say, Lord, help me to be patient uh, through it all. And sometimes, sometimes I, I'm, I'm, I'm internally, you know, I, I fail at this. But these are just things in which we can see ways. Because remember, doing penance is the command, all right, in the gospel. You know, repent and believe in the gospel, what we're told. So these are some things we can look at. You know, so I really recommend, again, looking at Isaiah chapter 50. It's a very important chapter. Church gives us the beginning of Lent to be able to see how to really exercise proper Lent. So I'll stop at this point. Okay? I don't take any questions anyone has. But... And you, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. This is like when I used to teach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, which means I'm going to get a question from Tony, which is all right. <laughs> Father, I was thinking about the fasting, and I, I remember when I was young, they you know, couldn't uh, eat anything from midnight on before communion, and then it was three hours, and then it was one hour. You know, what do you think was the impetus for, for doing that? Well, actually, a priest told me the reason. Nursing sisters in hospitals, midnight duty, that, uh, that they, uh, they wanted to go to Mass in the morning. It means they couldn't eat or drink anything all night long. It was that was one of the major inputs and impetuses for relaxing that rule, so that bringing it to three hours and anyways. But that was that was one of the reasons, practical reasons they did it that brought that about. Okay, so dispensation didn't exist then. Well, I probably it did, it but uh, anyway, but that's that's how they solved it. Was just was just relieving it because I because I remember. I was taught, it was about, about three weeks before I made my first communion, that we're not to have anything from midnight on. Right. And then quickly I started to teach us, it's three, it's three hours now. And then, and then I remember also in the first weeks after, where we didn't, they didn't provide any breakfast, so we had to fast. And my mother said, you are not going, you know, I, I, you, know you, you, you eat something to eat. And I'll, I'll explain it to the sister. The sister wasn't very happy, but then, <laughs> But then they had to do with my mother. So the next year, what they did, they made sure we had we had we had toast and cocoa after we we had mass, so the children had something to eat. So they, so my, I guess my mother prevailed. <laughs> God rest her soul. Yeah. One other, I'll just one other thing to mention that we, the same priest who told me the story about the nursing sisters. Also, his name was Father Urban Adam, his Capuchin, and he wrote a little book on canon law. And at the time, it was the only thing in English, and so it was a bestseller because everything else was in Latin. And the canon law professors at the time really railed against it, but it still was a good seller because you know priests could could convert. But it had all kind of things just. Uh, with you know a computation of time, you know being able to figure out making making use of the law for like for fast because you remember it was was pretty strict so they had tables of account you know, tables of permissibility in them, which you could use because uh, because the strict rule was you were supposed the priest was supposed to celebrate the liturgy of the hours in its entirety before midnight, so there used to be stories that the Jesuits in Southern Maryland 
who hadn't finished their office, so they'd stop, turn their car lights on, and be standing in front of the car, trying to finish the liturgy of the hours before midnight. Uh, and I know there are also cases that people would also be checking to see, you know, how long they, they you know, they were at a party, how long they could keep, keep eating meat, so because there was a thing. I know, like Indiana, Pennsylvania, it was plus 20. So in other words, that using the, law, the, the, the permissibility things that you could actually eat until 20 after 12 uh, and still keep within the, the guidance of the law. That's part of the reason Paul VI wrote Penitentiary was just realizing that kind of thing was just, that we really need to cut back and look at what, look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because uh, then, because that's important. Yes. He, he always says, how would you like to be the last person that went to hell for eating meat on Friday? <laughs> Anything else? Well, then let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming.